Before my first trip to Europe in 2022, I knew that my greatest challenge would be staying present. This was our honeymoon, six years after we got married. My wife Jocelyn used to live in France, and I am a first-generation half-Sicilian. I had to engage with it. I didn't want to feel disconnected, as I have on so many tired nights in Chicago. I didn't want the streets I'd walk to feel like any other streets I knew. What I didn't know was that once I got there, it happened automatically. Just to navigate, or even to have a conversation with anyone. Being aware of the present time and place in which you are standing is, it just happens. Mostly anyway. But the other thing that struck me, everyone knows, Europe is old. Someone else walked these same cobblestones hundreds of years ago, maybe even a thousand. As an American from Chicago, that blows my mind. It seems that in places with this much history, living in the present also means physically being in the ancient past, as if the past and present are inseparable. My world got a lot bigger on this trip. Paris. I've never been to a place so visible. It's as if being seen is an underlying purpose of almost everyone and everything in this city. Seen in so many ways. By someone. Anyone. Paris is a gallery the size of a city. Depictions of its pain and suffering, triumph and rule, loss and rebirth surround you. Wherever you look, a piece of some story is unfolding, and the stories pile on. Paris rushes you, because humanity is a strange herd. We move against each other, we cross paths, but we move together, somehow. We move on to connection, routine, purpose, to the past, to the future, sometimes just to anything, anything else. Pressure moves us, like our own blood cells. We move because the parent organism must survive. Paris is in love with the idea of love, with the dream and the nightmare with its own pain and glory, in all of its ambient beauty. Paris wants to be seen. I don't know if I fell in love with Paris, but I felt Paris, smelled it, tasted it, and I definitely saw it. Only once in my life did I feel like I might have stepped into the past. And that was at Versailles. The king and queen are here. They drift through this Byzantine court, surrounded by tributes to their power. They're strolling through the dilettante gardens. They abide by ritual, their symbol of structure and control. They were placed here in this dimension of their own making, parallel to the one in which their people live and suffer. This place feels uncanny, imposing, mollifying, 
and that feeling is royal distance. As classical music poured through the gardens and echoed off Baroque statues and fountains, we wandered, walked the dream, felt the royal distance. The world we knew for a time had faded out, gave way to the past. In 1519, it is said that the King of France sat by the bed of Leonardo da Vinci as he lay dying. The King cradled his head in his arms and called him grandfather. This icon was once just a gentle old man loved by a friend. When he died, da Vinci left the world an unbeatable legacy. But I'll never know the human being, the grandfather who died in the arms of a king. Because history stands between us. Between us and so many other lives throughout time. But not for our late friend Fabrice, who hosted us in Blois with his loving partner Mark. Fabrice passed away unexpectedly months after we flew home. I'm grateful to say that I did get to know him. But he too was legendary. Famous Fabrice, I called him. He was well known around town. He owned a local pharmacy and was friends with the mayor. I got to know his kindness and his big heart. And he was one of those few people I felt really comfortable with right away. Every legend was once just a person, but only a select few will ever get to know them. The person behind the legend and carry the memories of them through the course of their lives. This was our group. Jocelyn, Marie, me, Emo Barney, Snarky Mark, and of course, famous Fabrice. We'll remember you, buddy. See, off the coast of the Italian mainland, there is a bridge between the very old world and the current one between Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Many took it by force, others embraced it warmly, and yet others found it in desperation. But no matter where they originated, the ones who stayed, eventually, they became Sicilians. That's Sicily, and this is the capital, Palermo. 
cosa più semplice da fare è scaricare l'applicazione. Ciao cioccolatina, devi mangiare che sei fatta magra. When I got off the plane and walked towards the bus, I saw the mountains in the background, and it hit me. This was the first time I'd ever stepped foot on ancestral lands, and I was overcome with gratitude and emotion, a kind I never felt before, nor could I accurately describe. Some of the things that make Palermo beautiful are also indicative of its struggles. One of my favorite things is the ethnic and cultural mingling that it represents. But I know that much of this was the result of painful histories, invasions, war, and escape from other crises. History unravels under your feet almost as much as it does in books. But that's not always on your mind. You're here, right now. And no matter how old the place is, the current version of it never existed before. The present is distinct. Oh, and food. Few things can reliably hold my attention than great pizza, pasta, and drinks. We love Palermo and had a great time, but there was one more place to go on our journey. Cimina, a small town southeast of Palermo, Sicily, is a town of memory. I'm half Sicilian, so my father's cell, along with his immediate family, are from here. But since he left for America in 1955, he hasn't made the trip back. So all I knew were the old stories. The streets were quiet, clean, mostly empty. And at the end of the street was the edge of town. Walking around, we met Tony, a wonderful guy who lives alone in the hills. But he's married to the beauty around him. As we talked, he would go between how beautiful the views are, how peaceful his life is, but also that his wife lives in America without him. It wasn't sad though. It was warm, pleasant, almost enchanting. As foreigners, we were greeted with warmth and curiosity, welcomed into homes, and invited back as part of the extended family. At the end of the street was the edge of the earth. It seemed to be floating, like a sailboat of ancient streets, stone houses, empty alleys, shrines, memory. Its sails were the church towers. Its path, endless hills. were so quiet I could almost hear the voices of my father and his younger brother Santo echoing as they rioted down the steps. In the still warmth of the sun, in front of the church of San Giovanni. My grandmother Rosalie passed away two years before, followed soon after by her stepdaughter, my Aunt Mary. But we felt her presence here a place she hadn't called home for decades. But the morning we arrived, Jocelyn found a small rose resting between the street and the wall of one of the houses near where my father was born. 
a rose for Rosalie. She pulled the petals and scattered them over a path leading to the church. For Nana, she said, as if Nana's spirit was ready to leave home and come out into the warm morning sun, land on the stones of Chimina, town of memory. The past is alive in me, literally, in my DNA. But I'm an individual. I live in the here and now, and I think about the future. I'm more than my history. The past is the library, the bookcase, the jacket of the book, the paper and the ink. But I'm the book. I'm the story. And only I can write it. At least half of it. The other half? It's up to the universe. Our honeymoon ended back in Paris, and at that point, we needed a break from our vacation. But we needed the vacation too, to work together, do something we always said we'd do but never did. For me to zoom out and see firsthand that there's a bigger world out there, and that even this was only a small piece of it. But the most unexpected thing I learned, which helped me be more present, was that when I zoomed back in, I can see that small worlds matter too, more than ever.